All right, good morning and welcome. I'm Annie Pepitone, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Simmons College Graduate Symposium. So the symposium was started by the co-chairs of the student chapter of the Society of American Archivists as an opportunity for students in the Graduate School of Library and Information Science, or as we commonly call it, GISLIS, for now. <laughs> <laughs> to present their original research in a professional manner. Uh, it provides students with the chance to demonstrate how they're contributing to their respective fields. And this symposium is a little bit different and more unique from, from previous years because we're opening it up more to the graduate community as a whole. And so we are extending the welcome to the entire graduate community from this point forward and we're so excited to branch uh, these bridges between social work, children's literature, school of management, and GISLIS. Um, and so we want to foster that scholastic collaboration from this point forward. And uh, in honor of this commitment to the future, we have titled this year, Moving Forward, Transitioning, well, Transforming the Way We Think. And so an endeavor like this cannot be done alone. I would like to start by thanking our wonderful symposium committee. If you guys could all stand, please. Go away. <laughs> we would also like to thank all of our volunteers, including those manning the tables outside and those also doing our moderation today. So thank you. And last but not least, we would also like to thank our faculty advisor, Dr. Kathy Wisser. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the support of GISLIS uh, and giving this monetary contribution to making our, basically, uh, mark on GISLIS and the community as a whole. So I want to uh, start with something kind of important, so the bathrooms. As you all may have seen, we have the bathrooms down the hall, both men and women, in the same area for once. Mm -hmm. And so, basically, if you ever need to do anything down that way, we've got food around the corner along with coffee. And the breakdown for today is in your program, right inside the first page, as you notice in our lovely program. We will begin with our keynote presentation, followed by a 15-minute break. And then we will go on to session one, which is literacy and literature, which will lead us into lunch, which will be about a full hour. And then we will begin session two, libraries, literature, and social change. And then we'll have a brief break and begin session three, our last session, technological advances in libraries, archives, and museums. So this year, we are so excited and happy to welcome Michelle Clunan as our keynote speaker. When it comes to forward thinking in libraries, archives, and museums, Michelle Clunan is at the forefront. She is a professor and dean emerita of the Graduate School of Library and Information Science here at Simmons. She's written widely in areas of preservation, book trade, history, and bibliography. Her recent publications have concerned the preservation of digital media and the ethical, social, and political aspects of preservation. Her commitment to the field is evidenced through her numerous appointments to and the involvement with professional organizations and institutions. Now, this is a long list because she is so dedicated. We've got the American Library Association, the American Printing History Association, and the Northeast Document Conservation Center. In pursuance of her interest in international preservation education, she is a member of the preservation and conservation section of the International Federation of Library Association Institutions. From 2006 to 2009, she additionally coordinated a multi-university library initiative to train Iraqi libraries. Her work on preservation, cultural heritage, and exploring issues of change, continuity, and the future. Please give me a warm welcome for Michelle Clooney. Very generous introduction. So I'm happy to be here this morning, and I want to in turn thank Annie, as always, for, for technology assistance, and Kathy Wisser for the tireless um, 
her tireless efforts on behalf of the graduate students and to help make this possible. So um, when Kathy asked me to do this, I asked her if I could revisit a talk I gave at the University of Texas in October. It's the annual um, Don Davis Library History Talk. And what I find is when I do a talk for the first time, it's very much a work in progress. So I welcome the opportunity to continue to work on this topic and think about it. So uh, that I will do. I don't have a clicker, so I'm behind the podium, and I will make an effort to step out from time to time. So um, we'll figure out this one So uh, will libraries of the future preserve cultural heritage? Sometimes inspiration strikes at home or close by. While I was putting together this talk, I serendipitously came across a recent photograph of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, the building next door to where I grew up. The museum's history touches on one of the themes I will consider, preservation and the place of memory in cultural heritage institutions. The Museum of Science and Industry was originally the Palace of Fine Arts, one of many buildings that formed the White City, also known as the World's Columbian Exposition, which ran from May 1st, 1893 to October 30th, 1893, and drew some 27 million visitors. The exposition was created to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World in 1492. And that's exactly how it's described. Some people might describe that a little bit differently and not see it as a celebration. Um, <laughs> although most of the buildings were built as temporary structures, after the exposition ended, a fire destroyed all but a few, an irony in a city that was largely destroyed by the fire of 1871. Lucky then that the Palace of Fine Arts was fireproof. The Palace of Fine Arts was first reborn as the Field Museum of Natural History, and after the museum moved closer to the Chicago downtown area in 1933, the building began, became the Museum of Science and Industry, which it remained. Built for the exposition by Burnham and Root architect Charles Atwood, the building was designed in the neoclassical style of many of the structures. Buildings were coated with stucco and painted white. This earned the exposition the moniker, The White City. Um, described by Catherine Lee Bates, a visitor from Wellesley College, who later worked the image into the lyrics of America the Beautiful as thine alabaster city's gleam, <coughs> undimmed by human tears. From the exposition's inception, White had decidedly mixed connotations. As plans for the exposition were shared, it soon became clear that it was being shaped by white men who had a limited worldview. African Americans and women contested their lack of representation in the planning. According to Robert Rydell, the world's Columbian exposition reflected broader struggles in American society and culture that were not to be resolved in Chicago. Women had a champion in socialite Bertha Honoré Potter, who organized the construction of the Women's Building which was designed by Sophia Hayden, also from Boston. However, Potter represented the perspective of upper middle class and upper class women. Still, although underlying class struggles were not addressed, the building succeeded in bringing women together from across the country and the world in pursuit of celebrating women's achievements. The 8,000 volume library of women authors that was created was a remarkable accomplishment that I will return to briefly at the end of this talk. <coughs> so here's the women's building. Love that, love that boat. There's the gondola. <laughs> that hasn't, that lagoon part didn't survive, unfortunately. And there's another, there's a photo of the women's building. The once gleaming towers of the now disappeared World's Columbian Exposition cast a shadow on late 19th and early 20th century American history. Yet walking around the back of the Museum of Science and Industry today, where the lagoon laps up against the building's rear steps, 
and the graceful designs of Frederick Law Olmsted's park can still be enjoyed, and it creates a sense of historical continuity. Expeditions showcase progress and help people build an optimism about the future. As the one remaining structure on the exposition site, the Museum of Science and Industry continues to aspire to the future. Um, just parenthetically, last year they did a 3D reenactment of the Columbian Exposition. So as I mentioned, only a few of the buildings survived the fire. Two stand in place while three others moved. One to Brookline, just a few blocks from here. The Dutch House at 20 <coughs> Netherlands Road um, served as the Dutch Coco House at the exposition. It is a copy of a town hall in Fredericker, Netherlands, and it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. Photos that I took of it um, just a couple days ago illustrate memory and preservation. I wanted to get two photos in here. The, the building's wrapped, and I, I went there um, the other morning, and there's construction going on there, so I suspect that it's being um, renovated now. Memory, preservation, and heritage are terms I will use in this talk. Memory must, most commonly refers to retaining and recalling experience. It can refer to individual and collective experiences. Psychologists, philosophers, historians, neurologists, and scholars from other disciplines draw upon memory studies in different ways. Preservation is similarly used in a number of disciplines. Here I use it to mean the care of movable, immovable, natural, man-made, and socially constructed heritage. Care refers to proper storage and use, physical treatment, reformatting, education, and so on. There are limits to what we can preserve due to natural deterioration, global warming, acts of terrorism, war, and so on. Heritage refers to that which has come to us from the past. Heritage helps us to form our memories. Much of the time, heritage can be preserved. To place preservation in a library context, I will take a broad look at its 5,000 year history using a framework created by library historian and bibliographer Donald Crummel. Please excuse this necessarily brief historical gallop. <laughs> so here's um, Don's uh, schema um, and uh, in an article that he wrote called Fiat Lux Fiat Latabra. So let there be light, but also let there be hiding places, <coughs> retreats, lairs that are dark. That's the best I can do in terms of translating Latabra. In comparing his seven ages, Crummel reminds us of the persistent value of each type of library. New types of libraries don't necessarily replace old ones. Following each of Crummel's ages, I'll talk a little bit about the impact of the period on preservation. So the first one is, is um, 3000 BC, Quotidian, the Working Archive and Emerging Civilization. The earliest libraries and archives preserved writings and records. They were also storehouses of information. Crummel refers in this first age to the Sumerians in the region of the Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, known as the Fertile Crescent, which is Iraq today. There was an emphasis on record keeping and safekeeping to maintain and preserve the government. From a preservation perspective, the ancient temples stored commercial and government documents, as well as religious and literary works. Many of the baked clay tablets from Mesopotamia have survived. Um, stage two, um, academic center of culture and the Alexandrian library. I just, I love this image of the Alexandrian yeah, Library. <laughs> Don't you want to go there? Yes. Yeah. 
It's just wonderful. Um, Crummel uses an example for this age, the Alexandrian Library, which was established by um, Ptolemy I in the third century BC. The library catalog, or Panakis, was created by the librarian and scholar Callimachus. Prior to the Panakis, catalogs were primarily inventories. Callimachus organized works by author and title. In a sense, writes Crummel, the Panakis established the first major literary canon. We would know more about this legendary library and academy if the catalog had survived. The Ptolemy rulers sought to acquire and preserve the entire corpus of Greek literature and significant works in other languages. Its eventual destruction came about as a result of several fires, regime changes, and changing cultural and religious influences. The Alexandrian Library offers a rich and complex history. The lack of preservation of its records or content points to some historical ironies. Amassing a collection in one place makes it vulnerable to disasters, natural and man-made. And the notion that you can control the information that you have collected, and often through coercive means, is itself a folly. For example, the Ptolemy rulers refused to export papyrus to Pergamon in order to discourage competition. This led to a Pyrrhic victory for the Alexandrian library. Pergamon craftsmen improved the quality of animal skins for writing by developing parchment, a much more permanent medium than papyrus, and more practical as well. A scribe could write on both sides of the skin. It became the dominant writing medium until paper making was introduced to the West more than a millennium later. A centralized library collection is susceptible to vandalism and terrorism, as we are still regularly reminded. In 1986, an arsonist um, set fire to the Los Angeles Public Library, destroying 400,000 volumes. 20% of the Los Angeles Public Library's collections. And in 1992, as part of the siege of Sarajevo, the National and University Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina was destroyed, resulting in a loss of over a million books. So the next phase, the Middle Ages, which um, Kremel refers to as religious or the archival shrine, um, and so, I've, I've, to illustrate that, I have Monastery Scriptorium, St. Jerome. Good stand-in for the Middle Ages. <laughs> During the Middle Ages, the rule of St. Benedict of Nursia established precepts for monastic living, prayer, and work. Sounds like today, doesn't it? I don't know about the prayer part necessarily, but the work part, it definitely still rings true. Um, Flavius Aurelius Cassiodorus established rules for transcribing and maintaining manuscripts and general guides for library maintenance. The texts of classical writings were copied and distributed to monasteries throughout Europe, perhaps an early example of the notion that lots of copies keep stuff safe, <laughs> later coined by Thomas Jefferson a few centuries later, and of course part of locks and clocks for those of you who study digital preservation. Um, so I had to throw this in here. This is the Higgins Armory in Worcester. Have any of you been there? Um, Higgins uh, was part of um, a wealthy family some hundred years ago who fell in love with medieval armor and collected it. This is one of the most precious museums and he built a castle in Worcester for it which for a number of reasons was impossible to preserve and it closed on December 31st. So I got this picture, or Candy actually, Candy Schwartz took this picture for me um, last fall. And it's now got this collection, which in this purpose-built museum um, is going to be absorbed by the Worcester Art Museum, although a lot of it's been auctioned off um, to raise funds to save the collection. So. So next, on to humanism, testimony to virtue. Um, Giovanni Boccaccio and other 14th century Italian scholars 
believed that much could be learned from antiquity. Indeed, this insight led to some of the achievements of the Renaissance. Uh, Petrarch, who rediscovered Cicero's letters, is often dubbed the father of humanism. Petrarch formed an important personal library. Many such libraries would be created during the Renaissance, mostly by noblemen, and most of them were later dispersed. Nonetheless, the time was right, in Crummel's words, for learning, literacy, and libraries. If Petrarch helped the Italians usher in the Renaissance in the mid-14th century, jo Johannes Gutenberg further assured the spread of ideas by developing the tools for Western printing in Germany. Now, people say he invented printing. Printing was invented in China long, long, long before it came to Europe. But he did make four critical contributions um, which differentiated Western printing from printing in Asia. He perfected the metal that was used for printing, and he created an adjustable mold that assured that individual metal sorts could be cast, all of which were the same height and depth, but which allowed for the varying widths of the characters of our alphabetic writing. He developed a printer's ink suitable for metal type and adapted the grape or olive press, we're not sure which, for the printing itself. By Gutenberg's time, paper was widely available, much less expensive than parchment. Paper made possible the production of many books, pamphlets, and broadsides. The implications for preservation were predictable. Now there were many more items to preserve, and they were housed in many more places, as the Renaissance also led to the founding of numerous universities. And of course, universities beget university libraries. So on in our romp to um, the scientific era, which is the basis for knowledge and study. And this is a slide of um, Borges's um, Library of Babel in a wonderful David Godin edition with great illustrations. I have a couple of them in here. During the age of reason, libraries became valued as creations of the human mind. That is, libraries promoted the advancement of learning. The view of Francis Bacon that learning was predicated on three mental faculties, reason, memory, and imagination, has influenced library scholars, especially in classification. Thomas Jefferson modeled the organization of his library on Bacon's ideas. And as I was telling Eileen um, last semester, one of my students in 401 said, why don't we go back to Bacon and we call ourselves the School of Reason, Memory, and Imagination. Somehow I don't think we're going to wind up with that name first. <laughs> but it does have some uh, merit to it, I think. The first important book on library method, published in 1623, was Gabriel Nade's Advice on Establishing a Library. And I couldn't get a title page for that book, so I found um, another one at the same time. Nade touches on preservation issues in three respects. He maintains that to build great collections, everything must be collected, including what today we refer to as ephemera. And that was so far-sighted back then, I can't tell you. In a section of his manual on caring for collections, he discourages the unnecessary rebinding of books, and he proposes that libraries be housed in safe environments free of dirt, mo moisture, and noise. A second book on librarianship was published 23 years later in 1650, John Drury's The Reformed Library Keeper. Different in focus, Drury's book advocates for educated librarians to work in university libraries and for decent pay. The value of the humanists and scientists began to collide at the end of the century. The conflict was satirized in Jonathan Swift's The Battle of the Books. Swift refers to the 17th century battle uh, between the ancients, classical learning, and the moderns, <coughs> science and reason. Had the moderns surpassed the ancients in learning? The so-called battle has been extended to refer to the difference between humanities and scientists. In a nutshell, humanists seek original sources, scientists seek the most recent sources. For humanists, their domain was the library, while for scientists, it was the laboratory. 
This latter battle has never fully concluded, as can be seen in C.P. Snow's The Two Cultures, various versions of which were published in the 1950s and 60s, though Aldous Huxley noted some convergence in their divergence. <laughs> For many contemporary digital humanities scholars, the library is no longer solely their locus. Many researchers are mining big data for their research outside library walls. Relevant to a consideration of preservation is that historically, the fruits of humanistic research have had a better chance of surviving than laboratory notebooks and other artifacts of scientific inquiry, which were not placed in libraries. However, such distinctions can no longer be made digital artifacts are necessarily being collected by libraries, and university institutional repositories capture only a portion of faculty research. If items are not acquired by the library or the repository, they will not be preserved. So on to <coughs> the end of the Enlightenment and into the 19th century, democratic the library is instrument for social betterment, and what better illustration than our very own Boston Public Library. <laughs> the age of democracy can be measured in library terms by the new types of libraries that were created, and the tools that help users navigate collections. Crumble's inventory includes the development of national libraries, national bibliographies, which describe the nation's publishing output, national copyright legislation, national learned institutions, national archives, national education systems, and public libraries. Not all of these started in the 19th century, but they certainly came to fruition then. Also in the 19th century, high-speed printing presses made it possible to produce even greater numbers of books, periodicals, and ephemera. You know, it's very, common now for people to say, you know, that we're going through the biggest revolution since Gutenberg, you know. It's always Gutenberg, Gutenberg, Gutenberg. But actually in the 19th century, high-speed printing presses made newspapers possible. The genre of the newspaper was developed earlier, but it couldn't be so widely and rapidly disseminated until you had the technology which allowed for <coughs> Um, printing millions of copies instead of thousands of copies. That's a huge magnitude. And um, when I was doing research for something else a number of years ago, I found an article on nervous exhaustion because the public now had so much literature coming at them, which I love because we talk about that now. But um, it, there were a lot of reasons why that happened with the Industrial Revolution, more people being educated, also the rise of other kinds of libraries, um, so more reading, more kinds of literature, yellow backs, you know, available on railroad stations. It was just too much to take in. So they thought, maybe we, would, we should have just quit at that point and not produced anything. <laughs> <laughs> then we wouldn't be exhausted anymore. Anyway. So demands for paper increased, which led to the mass production of poor quality paper. More publications were produced than ever before, but of inferior quality. Add to this air pollution, which was the byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. Books decayed in unair conditioned stacks in the world's urban libraries. Access to books increased with the rise of public libraries. A new emphasis on users and their needs led to the further deterioration of collections. The higher use of inherently fragile 19th century publications further accelerated their deterioration. You know, one of the things that we tend not to think about, come on, <laughs> don't be shy, um, is that um, we had closed stacks. In many countries, they still have closed stacks. But until John Cotton Dana, you know, went on his tear about, we will open the stacks. And Reaganathan, you know, promoted that too. Even in public libraries, the stacks were closed. So the librarian was an intermediary, a true intermediary, a physical intermediary between the users and the books. So that is the beginning of a fundamental change in our profession, which I think we're still very much trying to work our way through, you know, with the internet and all kinds of other digital um, resources available. Use is a challenge to preservation. 
special collections departments now market themselves to broad audiences of, of big change, including school children, and many special collections are being digitized. Whether digitization increases or decreases the use of originals has been answered both ways. Digitization itself may cause damage to items that undergo it. Nevertheless, the pendulum has swung so far towards use that the trend is unlikely to, uh, unlikely to revert back to limited access, except in certain parts of the world. Okay, technocratic, instrument for social change. And this is um, an image from um, the National Digital Library of Korea. Libraries are increasingly viewed in the United States as instruments for social change during this final period of Crummel's exploration. Librarians are now considered advocates for access to information rather than as the arbiters of taste that they once were. Instead of fostering personal betterment, as librarians did in the 19th century, we now speak of personal empowerment that libraries can bring to their users. Technology has certainly allowed for the dissemination of ever-increasing amounts of information. By the end of Crummel's technocratic <coughs> age, online catalogs and bibliographic utilities had made information more available than ever before. But how are we to preserve all of this information? So he ends, Don Crummel ends his stages of librarianship at 1970. <laughs> So what is the new age? Well, I propose that um, it's ubiquitous and ubiquity. It's a form to enhance connectedness, and that is the stage of library development that we now find ourselves in. What age are libraries in now? You notice with the seven ages of librarianship, they range from thousands of years to just 60 years for his stage seven. What role does the library have today? We are no longer the primary conveyors of information. The web has overtaken us in that. However, libraries as well as archives and museums might be the only fora in which reliable information is consistently provided. And of course, not everything is available on the web. At the same time, we must not look at the two entities, the web and libraries, as mutually apart. In fact, as has been the practice in libraries for centuries, they have taken technological advancements from outside the library into their operations. That is, libraries are embracing the web as one of its many tools to enable them to fulfill their primary mandate of linking patrons with the information they need. One of Cromwell's conclusions is that no critical ideal of Latevra would argue for preserving the whole record of human civilization. Isn't the real problem that everyone wants to talk and no one wants to listen? Too many authors, too few readers? We've all seen lots of Latevra in libraries that look mighty unlikely to contain much Luke's. All that we need now is to figure out what is significant, in quotes. Given Aristotle's proposal that man is by nature curious, can zero population growth in libraries ever be compatible with freedom of expression? I'm not sure if Cromwell is on the right track with the notion of zero population growth in libraries. Given the proliferation of the books in the world and all media, huge numbers of which are not available digitally, I believe that libraries will continue to grow even as collections are being moved to off-site storage facilities to make space for more social activities in the physical library. I think that's a little bit of um, a confusion in the stage we're in right now. Uh, at least in academic libraries, there's quite a big move to build off-site storage facilities and free up more space in the library. And if the books are off-site, will they be out of mind? We have shifted our focus from technology to ubiquity. Library services, virtual or face-to-face, 24-7. Assuming that an increasing amount of information is being created digitally, how will we preserve it? Despite many efforts to preserve digitized and born digital media, there's still no consensus about the steps needed to manage it over time. 
Um, Bill LaFergie is one of the editors of the Library of Congress's Signal, which is really the go-to place, I think, for thinking about um, important digital preservation issues. And he says, everyone agrees that preserving files requires at least some basic level of intellectual control, a general description, file format identification, and other minimal metadata. We need multiple copies stored at a distance from each other. We need an ongoing audit process to check fixity to ensure files aren't getting corrupted. And we need a security regime to limit who manages and has access to stored files. Um, couldn't agree with him more. Increasingly, digital preservation calls for collaborative approaches since few, if any, individual libraries will have the resources to go it alone. For example, the Hathi Trust is a large-scale repository of digital content from over 80 research libraries. But what they are preserving is still only a fraction of the world's text, and it's based, it was based initially on the Google Books project. The longevity of their trust cannot be assured. The rhetoric for our digital future is strong. Here are some phrases that I've jotted down at recent library conferences. Is this digital determinism? Okay, and here's the quotes. From stored knowledge to smart knowledge, we must make knowledge more usable. Connecting, not just collecting. We must embrace different forms of ownership. It's not just about access, it's about the reuse of information. Why would we want old access models for new media? All of these quotes beg the question. They presume that the digital dilemma of preservation has been solved, but has it? Is this our vision for the future of libraries, or is it just a series of best guesses about the role of the library? Implicit through the seven ages is the library as place, La Tebra. Dynamic and striking library buildings, large and small, public and private, continue to be built. A clear example of this is evidenced in the annual April issue of American Libraries, which until this year, actually, I just read the April issue, um, for the last 20, 30 years has been devoted to library buildings and renovations. But increasingly, many collections are being moved off site and the library space is being reallocated as communal user space. In many cases, libraries today are defined less and less by their physical collections. In fact, you know, the Association of Research Libraries uh, used to rank the top 123 research libraries by the size of their collection, and now it's by um, other measures, including how much they spend on, on the library. So that is um, a, a significant shift that we're not thinking in terms of pure numbers and looking at the value of our collections anymore, in universities anyway. This is short-sighted. The physical collections have a lasting value that may not be equaled by their digital counterparts. Better to define a library, I think, by the totality of its services, which will include being able to supply its patrons with information in a variety of media, analog and digital. The hexad. This is a, a shot of uh, another illustration of the Library of Babel which of course disappeared. <laughs> CODA, Places of Memory. The women's building at the Columbia, <coughs> World's Columbian Exposition, which I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned the importance of the library to the women's building. Some 8,000 books written by women were collected for the exposition. Unfortunately, the collection was scattered and the card catalog was lost after the exposition. Uh, Sarah Wadsworth and Wayne Wigan have assembled a database of the titles that they could document as having been in the library. And the library will now have a second life as a resource for further study. But more to the point here, these scholars are in effect reconstructing and thus preserving the original women's building library and its content. The New York Public Library. 
So this is a great illustration which appeared on the cover of Scientific American in 1911, which is a cutaway of the New York Public Library. So you could see the, um, the high technology at that time of the pulley systems, you know, getting the books from one floor to the other. Recent plans to renovate the main branch of the New York Public Library and to move the books to New Jersey have resulted in public controversy and lawsuits. Is a library defined by having its books on site? Does NYPL run the risk of losing its identity without its storied Fifth Avenue location? Time will tell. With all of our modern technology and the increasing availability of text online, people still want analog materials in a physical building. The materiality of the building and its contents are part of the experience and memory contained in a library. And I love the fact that the lions at NYPL are called fortitude and patience. While all of this is playing itself out in the front pages of the newspapers, there they are. Do we preserve the collections and the space? How tightly are these two intertwined? As digital preservation activities increasingly move out of the library and into IT and into the cloud, what about the role of the library itself? In the 1987 film, Slow Fires, then librarian Pat Batten predicted that libraries would move to a leasing model rather than an ownership model of collections. So she was saying that in 1987. It's pretty remarkable. That prediction has turned out to be somewhat accurate. At the same time, libraries seem to value their special collections much more today than they did 20 years ago, when in some cases they were facing closure. The ability to digitize these assets seems to have, have enhanced their value in the eyes of some administrators. But let us not lose sight of the library as our collective memory. Libraries, archives, and museums remind us of our traditions, our history, and our cultural heritage. Whether memory is best served in physical or virtual places remains to be seen. But as I hope I've conveyed, the library can be the locus of all kinds of memory in several forms, each with its own longevity. Thank you. So I think we have plenty of time for discussion. And I hope there is some. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is, when digitizing items such as special collections, usually special collections are coming from institutions that don't always have um, a lot of resources to do so. Whether it's them not having the technology to do so on site, or not having the finances to physically have another business, big or small, do it for them. So uh, I can see <coughs> for probably a long time to come that there's going to be kind of this standstill unless new types of maybe inexpensive digitization comes about to be able to actually spread more knowledge, so to speak. I just wanted to see what you when thought you about say, that. Yeah, when you say a standstill. Well, in the sense that, that um, I think for at least a few years now, we've been to the point where you know, you've digitized books and records in one specific way. And um, resources are not exactly getting easier to find in the field of libraries or archives and even museums nowadays. Um, so this challenge, I think, presents itself. I mean, do you feel that eventually there will be some sort of push to be able to get more material out more easily. Yeah, actually, I think your question is loaded with a right. lot of there is a lot ideas there. there. So first of all, it's not always good to come to the table early. And a lot of the early digitization projects, there's nothing left of them. They didn't survive. The, the hardware and software is gone. People rushed a little bit too quickly. So we've now lost a lot of the earliest digital efforts. Um, two. 
you know, should we assume that everybody should digitize everything? I'm not sure. I mean, in fact, digitization, forget the cost of the digitization itself. Once your collection is out there, more people may want to come and see it. And if you're, and you see this more in New England because there's many more historical collections in many more kinds of institutions. Can you handle people coming to, to see your material? Sometimes you don't even have the staffing for it. Um, so it's not necessarily, necessarily a good thing. And actually, interesting, um, when the Google digitization project started, they didn't do special collections because they couldn't do it cheaply enough um, and quickly enough. Uh, so, they, so they left those kinds of materials. I think that sometimes waiting is a good strategy. Um, and, you know, and it's hard to generalize because in some cases it might be uh, a good thing for a small institution to do it. In terms of funding, there actually are companies that will digitize for you for free and then you get royalties from the publishing that they do. So there's all, all sorts of different kinds of models for the small institutions that feel that they need to do it. Yeah. So it might be appropriate to talk about the Digital Public Library of America at this point, because I was just attending a meeting with Dan Cohen, who's overseeing it, and they're located in the Boston Public Library, and they were talking about digitizing collections. So all of the large libraries, and when they say large, I think you have to have at least 250,000 pieces in order to be a, you know, a collection in and of yourself. Right. But you can join a node, apparently, and they said they even have a van and they will go pick things up. So they've got a lot of funding now. They right. just got another million dollars from Sloan. Sloan. Yeah. yeah. But they, so this whole notion of the Digital Public Library of America is trying to get some of these smaller collections up. And because we wanted to digitize some things from our art collection at Simmons, mm -hmm. and they're offering to do it for free. Yeah. Uh, so be it publishers or initiatives like that. But I, don't, but I don't think it's always desirable. It can be desirable, but we shouldn't assume that it's always desirable. And you know, the DPLA will never get everything. I mean, we live in a world that's so full of information, resources. Um, we'll never have universal bibliographic control <laughs> for those of us who went to an LAS programs a few years ago and people were still talking about the desirability of UBC. So, yeah. Um, so you talk a lot about the library as place, and I really, I love the, oh, well, I love the evolution of the library that you, that you uncovered. How do we deal with the perception of library as place in, to, in today's age? And, and can you talk a little bit about how the perception of libraries was in the past? I mean, because we all love libraries, um, but it's not up to us to keep the doors open and to, to re, I mean, maybe it is up to us to reassert the importance of libraries in our society. Um, can you talk just a little bit about that? And sure. How well, do you convince the folks on the green line that we should keep our libraries open? If we have something for them. Um, you know, I, really things changed fundamentally in the 19th century. You read that there were public libraries in Rome. Rome was a city full of slaves. I mean, who was going to those public libraries in Rome? A very small group of people. So the whole notion of public libraries is something that's really recent, because libraries were for the elite, collect in museums. Museums were private until like two centuries ago. Archives were royal until they became nationalized. So a very small group of people had access to uh, museums and uh, archives and, and libraries. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, public libraries are very much <coughs> identified with um, our, the democratic ideals of the United States. Um, but there's been a lot of library history that um, has really debunked the myths that we serve everybody. And there were some large-scale studies done um, in the, well, beginning in the 1920s or 30s, and then a rather large one was done in the 1940s that showed that um, most people who used libraries were, you know, of a certain social class. 
um, our notion has really evolved about what we do for our users. And New York Public was, and I'm sure Boston Public, it's just more has been written about New York Public. It was a place to learn English for recent immigrants. There was a big thrust on um, teaching people English. So obviously there was an agenda, and also for getting people off the streets who were drunks and public nuisances. So there was a whole movement in the, with the YMCAs to have libraries in the YMCAs as well. Um, the OCLC and the Gates Foundation and, um, God, I just forgot, Pew, have all done studies on who uses libraries. And I think that in some ways, I think we're, we're in one of the brightest periods we've ever had in terms of um, the diversity of our users in libraries. I, I just think that there's a lot unknown. What do people do when they go into libraries? You know, it's interesting, in the museum world, you have people who observe museum goers. <laughs> they sit in the rooms and they look at how much time you spend in front of each painting, um, whether you're reading the caption, and then museums make decisions based on that. Yeah, we do a little bit of that secret shopping kind of thing, you know, in libraries. Um, I don't know that we do it as much as museums. And I think that it can be, you can go on the wrong track by just trying to lure people in with glitzy things that may be popular today, you know, now it's all about maker spaces, but might be something nobody cares about in, the, in a few years. Um, but, um, I've also known librarians years ago who took flack for having videos in the library. So I, it's interesting. I went to the University of Illinois for my PhD, and it's in two towns. It's Reynolds, two towns, Urbana and Champaign. And the Urbana Public Library looked like a Carnegie Library, though it wasn't. You know, it's the classic Roman architecture, you know, the, the, um, the Temple of Knowledge or something like that. And um, the Champaign Public Library, at that time, they've now built an even newer library, had um, a building by a very progressive uh, Chicago architect, B.B. Babka, part of which group did the uh, Chicago Public Library later on, but, but Champaign was the first. They led posters and videos and movies. Back in the early 80s, before this was widespread, you couldn't even get in the parking lot of that library and it was very quiet in Urbana. But Urbana served this community. That's what they wanted in Urbana, and that's what they wanted in Champaign. So that's why we talk about the, important, the importance of um, assessment um, so that we really understand community needs and changes in the community for providing the kinds of services that we do. Um, so those, excuse me, those of us who are interested in history love to point out that um, there have always been generations of progressive librarians who found ways to serve their users. In, in California during the gold rush, they had librarians you know, on horseback go to remote regions to give books to users. So, or to people who were um, homebound in remote areas. So I think that we will continue to evolve and I predict that it will be in ways that we can't predict. Because we don't know what people are going to need or want, you know, in, in the upcoming years and decades. Yeah. So you mentioned the moving collections to remote storage and using the space for community type things. Do you think that that type of transformation is actually putting librarians at risk because they're used by, and even maker spaces? Why does a maker space have to be in a library? Why do these community, you know, what about? a library or an archives, you know, because it doesn't seem that the roles are defined, or have you seen that they're defining their roles in different ways, rather than just using their space? In well, you know, to me that, why do we need anybody in the cultural heritage community? <laughs> you know, why do we need curators and museums? I mean, and, and it's interesting, because when I went to the IEEE conference on the digital humanities, somebody from Google gave a presentation, um, and now it's getting a lot more publicity, but they were just launching it last fall, on the Louvre. They've digitized every painting, you know, to the smallest, you can see if there's a little hair on the brush that was left on there. You'll see it. You can see that painting more closely than you can with the human eye, especially for a painting that, you know, 
is behind a barricade or has extra glass on it, you know. And not only that, they have a floor plan of the Louvre, which shows you where every painting is hanging. Those of us who think about security <laughs> find that to be a little bit frightening, since there's a lot of theft in art museums. Um, and so why do you need, you know, not everybody can go to the Louvre. We already know from the Metropolitan Museum, and the, the numbers keep changing, and I haven't checked them for about a year, but it's something like five million people go through the gate at the Metropolitan Museum, but um, close to 40 million people access the collections online. That's a huge disparity. So why do we need them? Why can't they, why, why can't we just have a few people in museums to do basic maintenance? I mean, I think you could make the same, um, uh, case about libraries or museums, but people still flock to them. And um, in in UNESCO speak, you always look at tourism and um, how it boosts a, a local economy. And I think libraries usually aren't cited as much as boosting the local economy, but certainly some of them do, as do museums and historic uh, preservation sites. Well, and I, I also think, I think this is true of, of organization of information. The irony is that nobody pays attention to it until it doesn't work. And then all of a sudden, right. you know. It, so the great thing is that we have jobs, and if we do it well, nobody knows that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think that that's also part of librarianship of the future. Is as long as we do it well, nobody will notice us. Yeah, and our roles will change. I mean, I'm wondering what's going to happen to the collections, actually. Because already in the, the ARL group, they're, they don't all want to pay the storage for the offsite storage. How many copies? You know, they're debating issues like how many copies do we need? Um, and I think there's a real fundamental shift going on in collections. You know, as I said before, it used to be all about the numbers. And believe me, you know, Illinois was number three after Harvard and Yale. And I heard that every day <laughs> of the time I was there. They had to stay number three. <laughs> now, um, of university libraries, it is obviously New York Public and Library of Congress were bigger. It was all about that. And that's how they, in the early days, were able to recruit uh, faculty members who were educated in the Northeast to go to the wilds of Illinois, <laughs> or Kansas, or any of those other godforsaken places <laughs> where I grew up. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was the library. And, you know, implicit in that, with the whole um, RLG and the conspectus, if you were a library that was, you know, number five, you had to have everything. But now there may not be faculty members or even departments in some of those areas where you were designated a five. And so libraries are starting to question, why are we collecting this? Are, do we really have a responsibility to keep up this level of collection for the greater good? That's a real, sh I mean, that is a huge shift in um, university libraries. Similarly, you know, can we really say, um, and expect funding um, if we say that the library is the heart of the university, you know, when you're competing against everybody else on campus. So I think for a number of reasons, we're having to rethink the role of the library in all settings. Any other questions? I didn't talk that much about museums and archives in here because the focus was more on, on libraries, but obviously, you know, I tend to think of the cultural heritage institutions uh, more as a whole, because there's certainly a lot of commonalities as we try to think through these issues. Yeah? Um, on that issue of how libraries, archives, and museums are <coughs> joined in this union of cultural heritage institutions, uh, I wonder if anyone reads the, the Times Literary Supplement, because in, in the current issue, there's a column about how the National Trust in England, uh, it has many libraries that are part of the historic properties that have right. been donated to it, that are exceedingly difficult to use, not only in terms of being able to look at the books, but even in terms of being able to find out what books are in a particular collection associated with you know, some, some artist or author whose, whose house has been donated. And so there is a there is a very strongly worded column um, 
this week encouraging the National Trust to, which has a really great program of providing information about the, the furniture and the architectural history and landscape design associated with its properties. Um, so all, all these elements of cultural heritage that, you know, I think all of us here probably think cultural heritage is this sort of big thing that includes books as well as furniture yeah. and, you know, the, the correct shape of the balustrade and the garden. Um, so I wonder if you if you have some comments on how yeah. archives and museums and, and these sort of historical sites, can they improve their handling of traditional library type of materials? Yeah, it's so interesting to hear that because I started my life as a conservator and two of my colleagues spent years um, doing conservation work and maintenance on the National Trust houses in the UK, Northern Ireland, etc. So for a long time, they've put the resources into maintaining the collections in good condition. It's like the old warehouse um, model that we were looking at earlier on, and we'll take care of them, but, but you can't see them. I mean, that's complicated because some of these, um, you, you'd need to have some kind of uh, funding to get all of them online, but you know, maybe, and unfortunately in the UK right now, they're pulling money like mad away from these kinds of institutions. And forget about dig digitization, just having a catalog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see. Um, do you remember who wrote the article? If it has any impact. The name didn't stick with me, but I, I was curious. So I looked at it. Apparently, he's some kind of scholar of, of Portuguese history, which didn't really seem germane. Oh, he may be one of the regular Possibly, writers. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the he TLS. Just had a in his bonnet one day when he was yeah. you know, visiting a national trust property. But he's right. He couldn't get into the library. <laughs> But he made some, it, yeah. you should check the article. No, I mean, because these collections go back so many hundreds of years. And actually, you know, we do projects with um, um, Historic New England, and they are trying to make all of their collections more available and put more resources online. So I suspect eventually that will happen in the UK as well as other places. There's just so much stuff out there, and there needs to be the interest and the funding model to do it. But, you know, I don't know what funding model, because I didn't pay attention to those things back then. Um, I don't know what model of funding they used to do all the conservation and preservation work on those collections over the years. Um, it might have just come out of an era when there was more money for that kind of thing. So, you know, but actually you raised something, and you, you get this a lot when you read a lot of, well, it begins with the, the Universal Declaration after World War II, that we all own our heritage, we all have a vested interest in heritage, except when you don't. I mean, this is an ideal, obviously. If you want to blow up the Bamiyan Buddhas, you know, maybe you can't be stopped from blowing up the Bamiyan Buddhas. But, you know, we have this high ideal that um, heritage belongs to everyone, and we should work together across international lines to try to preserve works. 